Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day. And Father, the evidence of who you are is all around us in the world. From creation to the universe to the cross, the empty tomb, to your spirit living inside of us, to your goodness, your faithfulness, your kindness, your mercy being applied to our lives, changing our hearts on the inside. Your evidence is all around us, Lord. Help us to open our spiritual eyes and see truth, your truth in your word. God, thank you. Thank you for the evidence of your grace and your truth applied to our lives. In the mighty name, your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. All God's people said, amen, amen. You may have a seat. Our children are dismissed to Children's Church. And we ordered Bibles this week, but they haven't come in yet. So if you have a Bible, open up your Bible to Revelation chapter 19. If you don't have one, we'll have one for you next week, and you can follow the words up on the screen. So this morning we're looking at Revelation chapter 19, and we're looking at the, the marriage of the Lamb. The marriage of the Lamb. We're just going to study five verses, but it's a fascinating, awesome, amazing passage But to get your minds turned and thinking in the right direction, question for you this morning. What is your favorite part of a wedding? Of a wedding, maybe your wedding, maybe a wedding that you've been to. What what was your favorite part? I'm going to tell you, my favorite part, I was standing about right here at Christian Outreach Center in 1997. And I saw Irene coming down the aisle in that beautiful white dress. And my jaw dropped as I saw her beauty. And I said, wow! Wow! She's mine the rest of my life. And she came up to the altar, and Mr. Johnson gave me a little pat on the back. He says, she's all yours. And, she gave her, and he gave her to me in marriage. That was the, the highlight of my marriage, seeing her come, coming down the aisle. But for different strokes, different folks, some of us like different parts of a wedding. Some of us like the party. How many of you guys like the party after a wedding? I do. How, how, many, how many of you guys ever done the cha-cha slide? Come on now. Y'all done the cha-cha slide. Slide to the left. Slide to the right. Crisscross and all that stuff. But there's, all of us have favorite parts uh, of a wedding that we, that we like to be a part of. I love going to weddings. I love seeing the ceremony. I love seeing the vows. I love seeing the two become one. I love the party afterwards and the celebratory atmosphere of it. It's beautiful. And what we're looking at this morning is going to be the wedding of eternity. We're looking at the marriage of the Lamb. That's the focus of Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 10. I'm actually going to back up one verse, and we're going to go through verse 6 again. But verses 7 through 10 is the marriage of the Lamb. There is this huge wedding coming, family, and you don't want to miss it, okay? That's what the Bible is, by the way. The Bible is an invitation to the marriage of the Lamb. The Bible is an invitation for you to come and believe and trust in Christ and to be born again and to one day, man, we are going to be feasting. We are going to be celebrating. You think you've been to a party? You ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till we get to this party in heaven. It's going to be amazing. So the title of my message, The Marriage of the Lamb, we're studying... uh, Verse by verse, Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 10. So let's take a look at it this morning. First off, Father, thank you for your word. As we look at it, Lord, uh, teach us. Let us see it, pull the truth out of it, meditate on it, and build our lives upon it. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, Father. Amen. Amen. All right, so Revelation chapter 19, verse 6 says, Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude. I want to stop right there, because John... This is, according to verse 1, this is a scene in heaven, okay? So this is in heaven, and John says, I saw a great multitude. And that's amazing because the word multitude means innumerable. It can't be counted. That tells you how many people are going to be in heaven, how many people are going to put their trust in Christ, and how many people we're going to see in the glory of heaven. Now, this could be talking about uh, the saints that were taken up, it, it, the rapture, it could be them. It could be the Christians of all the past 2,000 years. But there's going to be a great multitude 
That's what John says here. There's going to be a great multitude. Heaven's not just going to be filled with just a few people. It's going to be filled with a lot of people from all tribes, every nation, all across planet Earth that have put their trust in Christ. It's going to be a great multitude. And then he says, I love this. And he says, and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. What I want you to notice in this verse is the worship. The worship that is taking place in heaven, how John describes it. He says, it's like the sound of mighty peals of thunder. You know, this great multitude that's worshiping in heaven, uh, what I want you to see is, is notice that the worship that's taking place in heaven. This is it's never half-hearted. It's never uh, toned down. It's not quiet. It's full-spirited. It's full-throated. And he describes it as being thunderous. That tells you how big this is going to be and how exciting this is going to be in heaven. That the worship, you think you've heard some worship music in the past from your favorite worship artist? Wait till you get to heaven. It's going to be the most amazing choir and the most amazing sound that you've ever heard as they sing what a magnificent statement at the end of verse 6. Hallelujah. We talked about this last week. If you weren't with us last week, that word hallelujah is a compound word. Hallel means to praise. Hallelujah is a is shortened name of the name of Jehovah or Yahweh. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So they're singing hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. There in heaven, they're going to see the perfection of God in all his sovereignty. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be beautiful. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to be magnified beyond all things. He's going to be the center of attention as they hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. But then you and I are going to play a part there in heaven as we celebrate in the marriage of the Lamb. Let's take a look at verse 7. Let's take a look at verse 7. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. So here in verse 7, he talks about the marriage of the Lamb. Pastor David, can you explain to me what's he talking about, the marriage of the Lamb? Maybe you're hearing this for the first time. In Jesus' day, marriage was the greatest social event in their culture. It had two stages, just like ours today. It had the betrothal, or what we would call engagement, and a ceremony. The betrothal began with a contract agreement between the bride, the bridegroom, and her parents. The bride would go and prepare herself for the wedding, and the bridegroom would go and prepare a home for his bride. Betrothal was the period that Joseph and Mary were in when they were found to be with Christ, when she, when she conceived the Lord Jesus. And then, uh, and then at the, an appointed future day, the bridegroom would return, some people say at midnight, with a torch lit parade to get his bride and take her to his home he had prepared. Not knowing the exact time of his return, she would keep herself ready in the lamp lit in the windowsill, awaiting his return with the lamp lit, letting him know that she was ready to be taken away to her new home. Upon his return, the bridegroom would be united to his bride, and he would take her to the new home, and they would celebrate with a huge feast, and everyone was invited. Friends and family, the, bri the Bible teaches that your relationship with Christ, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is just like a marriage. You entered into a covenant relationship with God through Jesus when you received him as your Lord and Savior. You know, we, we, we call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves believers, and those things are true. But you're also equally the body of Christ. You are the bride of Christ, okay? So you, you are the bride, and, and, and you have been betrothed to the Lord in your relationship with him. Let that sink in for a minute. Let that sink in for a minute. That's an amazing relationship that's centered on what Jesus did for you at the cross. 
He has purchased you. You've entered into this relationship. And the universal body of Christ is the bride, and he is the bridegroom. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He told the church at Corinth, he said, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. That's interesting to think about. You know, when you think about theology and you think about scripture and you think about our relationship with the Lord, that we are the, we are the bride. He is the bridegroom. We are here on earth with our lamps, the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. We are preparing for the bridegroom to leave a place called heaven, return to planet earth, and take his bride home to be with him, just like you would see in a first century wedding. You are more than just a Christian. You are the body of Christ. You are the bride, and Jesus is the bridegroom. Jesus left planet earth to prepare a home for us, and one day he will return, likely, spiritually speaking, at the midnight hour, and Jesus will take his bride home. We call this the doctrine of the rapture, the rapture of the church when Christ returns to this earth and snatches the church away to be with him. This doctrine can be found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18, which I'll read it to you. This is, this is the bridegroom returning to earth to take his bride home, just like you would see in the first century wedding ceremony. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 through 18 says, For this I say, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, talking about Jesus, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. This marriage ceremony of Jesus being the bridegroom and you being the bride will be consummated. It will come together. It will be complete at the rapture of the church when he comes to earth to take his bride home. The marriage will be complete. This, this, this marriage celebration that's going to be, take place in heaven is going to be like nothing you've ever seen before. It is going to be the party of all eternity. It's going to be a feast. It's going to be amazing. And Christ invites everyone to come to him to repent, believe the gospel, put their trust in him, and they will become the bride. God will take them, move them out of darkness, and move them <clears throat> into his glorious, beautiful kingdom we call the bride or the body of Christ. So that brings up a big question when we think about the bridegroom and the bride and the, the, um, the bridegroom going off to prepare a home. What does the bride do in the meantime? What, what, does, what, is, what does a bride do in a marriage when she's, in, when she's engaged? She gets herself ready. She gets herself physically ready, her beauty, her estate, her everything. She gets all of her affairs in order. And family, you and I should be doing the exact same thing. And that's what he alludes to. Bring back up verse 7. At the very end of verse 7, it says, And the bride is what? The bride has made herself ready. And it continues into verse 8 and how we make ourselves ready. Verse 8 says, And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linens, bright and clean. For the fine linens are the righteous acts of the saints. I love John's imagery here in this text. Because he, he describes this of what you would think on a wedding day. When you, when you see the bride in the wedding gown, Fine linen, bright and clean. You know, one of the most beautiful pictures is when you see the bride walking down the aisle in her fine linen, bright and clean. And God wants you and I to do the same while we're here on this earth preparing for his return. Preparing for his return is to make ourselves, to, to, to clothe ourselves with fine linen, bright and clean. How do we do that? How do we prepare ourselves for the, re the soon return of Christ? How do we do that? By the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit, you commit your life to following Jesus. It's that simple. 
It's that simple. It's not rocket science. You know that Christ is going to come one day in the future. No man knows the day. No man knows the hour. And you make a decision today in your heart and mind, Lord Jesus, I'm going to serve you. And in serving Christ, you say, Lord, I'm going to follow your word. I'm going to let it light my path. I'm going to let your Holy Spirit lead me. That's what it means to prepare. We commit our lives to honoring Christ, to serving Christ, and we do that by walking in the Spirit. By walking in the Spirit, crucifying our flesh, and saying, Holy Spirit, I give you rule and reign of my life today. Help me to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Help, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, bring the evidence in my life. What does the evidence look like? That We call them the fruit of the Spirit. They can be found in um, Galatians chapter 5. But in Galatians chapter 5, first we're given, if Galatians chapter 5, verses 15, verses 16 through 24, first we're given the, the, lust, the works of the flesh, and then we're given the fruit of the Spirit. Let's look at how to not prepare. This is how, you, this is how, you are, this is how you, you're not prepared for the return of Christ. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Here it is. Here's, here's how to not be prepared for the return of Christ. Here's what it means to follow the flesh and not follow the Spirit. Actually, in verse 19, it says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, for which I forewarned you, just as I forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, family, verses 19 through 21, this is a, a description of life before Christ. This is a description of life before Christ. And this is a description of the things that we leave behind as we grow in our faith, as we grow in our walk with the Lord, as we deepen our faith, as we uh, study the word more, and the Holy Spirit uses the study of our word. He sanctifies us. He sanctifies us and makes us holy, and he causes us to leave these things behind. These are the deeds of the flesh. When the Bible talks about the flesh, he's talking about your, your sinful, fallen nature. And every single one of us in here, every single one of us in here, I'll repeat that, has a sinful nature. We have that old man that wants to rise up and that wants to do the deeds of darkness, the carnal flesh, the carnal mind. But that's the old man. That's the one that we leave behind. And that's the one for the Christian. This is, if you're living this way, you're not preparing yourself for the return of Christ. You're not clothing yourself with fine linen, bright and clean. So, Pastor David, how do I prepare myself for the return of Christ? Be in the Word. Be filled and yielded to the Holy Spirit. Be growing in your faith. And then check this out. It's not something that you do but it's something that the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit will produce fruit. And that's where he continues in Galatians 5. Let's continue in Galatians 5. Next verse after 21 is verse 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So what do we do with the flesh? What do we do with the deeds of darkness? We crucify them. We crucify them, and then we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And we say, Lord, produce your fruit. Produce your fruit of, of, of gentleness. You know, let's be gentle and kind. Pr produce the fruit of self-control. You know, before Christ... I just I did whatever my flesh wanted to do. Whatever my carnal mind wanted to do, I just ran after it with all my heart. But after I got saved, the Spirit grew, produced self-control in me. 
and I'm able to control my life. Um, and it says, in those who belong to Christ Jesus, we've crucified the works of the flesh, and we've put on the fruit of the Spirit. I don't know about you, but this is the kind of person I want to be around. This is the kind of person I want to be. I want people to know Pastor David as a man who's filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what it means to be ready for the return of Christ, is we put off the old man and we put on the new man. How do we do that? One of my favorite Bible verses, 1 Peter 2.2 2 says this, and this is why we study verse by verse at Calvary Chapel, because 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word so that you may grow in respect to salvation. The purpose of studying the Bible is we do want to fill our heads with knowledge, but that's not the ultimate purpose of studying the Bible. The ultimate theological, spiritual dynamic that takes place when you study the Bible is you read the pages of Scripture and you meditate on it. The Holy Spirit living on the inside will take that reading of the text and cause you to grow, cause you to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. And as we grow, as you grow in the Word, the fruit will increase. Uh, less Word, less fruit. More Word, more fruit. More yielding to the Lord. Because this, this, this Spirit, the Holy Spirit inspired the Scriptures. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed. It's theonostos. It's, it's literally breathed out from God. When you read the Bible, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to us and instructing us. And this is how you prepare for the return of Christ, is to be yielded to him and serving him with all your heart. The second way, the first way is to be yielded to the Spirit. The second way we make ourselves ready is simple this, simply this, help other people get ready. Help other people get ready for Christ. You know, we, the Bible says that we are ambassadors for Christ here on earth. Our job is in our Christianity is first you serve Christ, I serve Christ from our hearts being filled with the Spirit, but also we help others. We help others. We call that evangelism. Evangelism. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20 says, Now these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Key phrase in that verse that's up on the screen is reconciliation. He says he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, God has said, here you go, body of Christ. Here is the ministry of reconciliation. Now go out and share the gospel. Go out and share with people the truth that they are invited to the marriage of the Lamb, that they must be born again, that they must repent, that they must put their trust in him. He's given us this ministry of reconciliation. You see, man before he comes to Christ, is separated from God. He's an enemy of God through his wicked works in his mind and his heart. But through the gospel, reconciliation can, be, can take place. The sinner can come to Christ and be completely forgiven at the cross so that there's peace with God. That's the ministry of reconciliation. And then he says in verse 19, we're given the word of reconciliation. This Bible is the word of reconciliation. It explains to us how you can be right with God. It explains to you how to obtain righteousness. It gives us peace of mind and security knowing that our hearts are right with him for all eternity. And then he says in verse 20, he says, he says as though God were making an appeal through us. It is our job. God doesn't have a bullhorn up in the clouds announcing to the world the gospel. He has given that ministry to us, and it is our job to witness. It is our job to invite the world, and it is our job to be able to articulate 
the gospel. Can you articulate the gospel? If someone comes to you and says, how can I be saved? What would you say to them? What would you say to them? Basically, in a nutshell, they, they need to understand that they need to repent, turn from their sin, acknowledge that they're a sinner, turn from that sin, and put their trust in Christ. It's simple. Uh, you're a sinner. Christ died on the cross for you. And if you will repent and believe the gospel, he will save you, and he will give you a new life. It's repentance and faith. Salvation is like a coin. Repentance on one side, faith on the other. Repentance means you turn away from sin. Faith means you put your trust in Christ and you commit your life to following him because of the change that takes place. That's our, that's our, our, our witness to the world is, is, to, is to get saved, is to put their trust in Christ. So that's how we get ready. We, we, we are led by the Spirit. We follow Christ and then we help other people follow Christ. Let's continue. Verse 9. He says, uh, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited, here it is, who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. The marriage of Christ, the, the marriage supper, this marriage of Christ, it will culminate in heaven with the marriage supper of the Lamb. It will be an all-out celebration. It will be an all-you-can-eat feast. It will be a beautiful table decked out with the finest foods to celebrate our union in eternity with the Lord Jesus. It will be the ultimate party of the ages that no one wants to miss. You know, people wonder what's on the other side. There's no need to wonder because God has revealed it to us in his word. And the evidence that the tr for the truth of the Bible and that everything it says about eternity is true is founded in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the, he is the, of all the religions in the world, all the major founders, you can go to their tombs today, okay? You can go visit where their body is buried. Well, guess what? There is no place where Jesus is buried because the tomb is empty. He rose from the grave and it validates the truth of his word and it validates the truth of eternity. Who is invited to this feast? Who is invited to this feast? Is it just a select number of people that's invited? Or, or, is it, or is it wider than that? Listen to what John says in Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17. He says, The spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let, those, let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. Notice in the very beginning of verse 22, it says, the spirit and the bride say come. The spirit, the Holy Spirit, through the bride, you and I invite the world to come to Jesus, to come to him for forgiveness of sin, for eternal life, for a new life. It's the spirit through the bride um, that invites the world. And notice he says, and let one who wishes Take of the water of life without cost. Again, salvation is a free gift. That's another thing that separates Christianity from all other religions of the world. All other religions of the world say, do, 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 do. You got to do this. You got to do that. Christianity says, you don't do anything. Christ has done it all. Okay? So Christ gets 100% of the glory for, for salvation. It's, it's, it's a free gift. It's without cost. Now, it's free to us, but keep in mind, it costs God a lot. It costs God the Father, his only begotten Son. So the, everyone is invited. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever pleases him shall not perish but have eternal life. But here's the deal. You have to come to God on his terms. Okay? You have to come to Christ on his terms. And to come to Christ on his terms means you turn from the old life, you turn from your sin, and you put your trust in him. It's not just enough to believe in a higher power. It's not just enough to say, I believe in God. That's not, that won't cut it. You have to go to the cross. A person has to put their trust 
in Jesus' death on the cross and in his resurrection from the dead and in the truth of his word. That is salvation. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It's exclusive. He's the narrow gate. He's the narrow doorway. He's the only way to get into heaven. So family, as we're, as we're talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb and this, and this uh, wedding, we need to understand that the, 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 Bible, the Bible itself is a wedding invitation. It's a, it's a wedding invitation to you. It's a wedding invitation to your neighbor. It's a wedding invitation to your friends. It's a wedding invitation to your coworkers to come and follow Christ. It's a wedding invitation to divorce the ungodly, sinful world. Listen to what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. He says, Paul says, talking about his relationship with God, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When he says, I have been crucified with Christ, what Paul is saying there is, the old man died. The old man, his old way of life, his old religion, everything, his old sinful way of living, he crucified it. There, there was a, at salvation, there is a divorce from the ungodly world and a marriage to the Lord Jesus Christ, a uniting with Christ in, in union. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. The Bible is an invitation to come and feast at the Father's table. Will you be seated at that table? Will our neighbors be seated at that table? Will our friends be seated at the table? For many of them, it, if we reach out to them, if we witness to them, if we share the gospel, if they receive Christ, they will be a part at that table. And this goes out to every tribe, every nation, and every people group. No one will be denied or turned away who comes to Christ in genuine repentance and faith. That is the wedding invitation. The, the, the scriptures does, doesn't give us a a lot of details of the, the details of the celebration and the party, other than it's a marriage supper. They're going to be singing hallelujah, and it's going to be very, very celebratory. It's going to be amazing, and it's going to be mind-blowing. So look, with that thought, look at verse 10. Verse 10, John says, uh, Then I fell at his feet to worship him. Now, who's he talking about there? He's talking about he's going to fall at the angel's feet. John is so overwhelmed. He's on the island of Patmos. He's having this vision. John is so overwhelmed in emotion that he falls to his feet. It would be like today, Publishers Clearinghouse coming to your front door and informing you you've won $10 million. What would you do? Woo! <laughs> you might pass out. You might be singing Hallelujah. But there's this overwhelm of emotion in John and his vision of heaven and his vision of what the future holds. Family, truly, the best is yet to come, okay? The best is yet to come for the believer. This is, this is beautiful, glorious good news that no one in their right mind would turn away from, okay? If we, understand, if we rightly understand the gospel and its impact, you will fall on your face in amazement. You will be blown away at the beauty of the Lord. You will be blown away at the good news of the gospel. No more guilt, no more shame. Complete forgiveness, complete reconciliation, complete peace of mind. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I just went over the hump, and I'm probably in the last half of my life, so I'm starting to have eternal thoughts, you know. You know, but my mind, when it comes to thinking about eternity and passing away, I have no fear. I have no fear and I have no worry. Why? Because my faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ and I know where I will spend my eternity. That's the most important thing that every single person on this planet should consider is what happens after death. Because when you leave this life, how long are you going to be gone for? Forever. 
man, there's nothing more important than, than your eternal life. There's nothing more important than salvation. And we need to come to grips with that and put our hope and put our faith in Christ and let eternity be set and secure so that we can have peace of mind in this life. I have peace of mind, and I hope you do as well. So it's joy, it's joy unspeakable. That's the thing I want you to see here in verse 10. He says, then I fell at his feet to worship him. John is just blown away in joy and excitement over what he is seeing, okay? He's not religious, but he's filled with joy. Listen to Psalm, Psalm 30, verse 11. He says, the psalmist says, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. Our relationship with Christ, our joy as we look forward to eternity, as we look forward to seeing the Lord Jesus Christ face to face, it should bring an air of excitement, of, of dancing. He's, he's, he's taken our mourning, he's taken the old life, he's forgiven us, and he's given us a spirit of dancing and gladness. At least in your hearts, there should be this spirit of dancing and gladness. Yes! Praise the Lord! I'm saved. I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. I'm right with God. It's okay to have a little bit of emotion. It's okay to be excited. Because it's going to be amazing when we get there. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, You will make known to me the path of life. Your presence, here it is again. I'm talking about joy. I'm talking about what John's experiencing in verse 10. In your presence is what? Fullness of joy. Your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Family, this should describe our Christian walk, okay? This should describe the Christian walk. Despite the world, despite the circumstances you're in, this should, this should be the essence of our Christianity of Psalms 30, verse 11, and Psalm 16, verse 11. Psalm 30, verse 11, 16, 11, I got it right. It's, it should be a spirit of dancing. It should be a spirit of gladness. It should be fullness of joy. There should be pleasures forevermore. You know, our eyes have been open. We're no longer walking in darkness. There should, there, it should bring joy and great peace of mind being in a right relationship with God. And 1611 says, you will make known to me the path of life. Not only do we get to experience God's joy and his grace and his love and his awesome excitement, but we get to follow him down the path of life. He will lead us by his word as we follow him. Verse 10, I've actually, I broke this up into three parts of verse 10. This, the second part of verse 10 says, but he said to me, do not do that, for I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren. This is an angel um, speaking to him. He says, don't, don't bow to me. He says, uh, I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus and worship God. Here we have, in verse 10, we have an angel teaching us. What is this angel teaching us in verse 10? Because this is an angel speaking to John. He's telling us this, family, that true servants of Christ hold to the testimony of Jesus. True servants of Christ hold to the testimony of Scripture. We refuse to bend. We can't be bought because the Lord Jesus Christ has won our hearts. Okay? And, and we, we don't bow. We, we completely hold to it. That means that we hold on to it with both hands, with all of our hearts, and we let nothing sway us in serving the Lord. And then this final phrase um, in verse 10, I want to bring to your attention. At the very end of verse 10, our last verse this morning, he says, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This phrase right here, every Bible study teacher should memorize. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What is he saying in this phrase? What he's saying is this, that the foundation, the background, and the purpose, or the spirit, of every verse in the Bible is to point you to Jesus. So when we're studying the book of Genesis, there's a story there, there's lessons there, there's application there. We're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, but ultimately, 
every verse in Genesis points you, should point you to Christ. As you, as you lead a Bible study, as you teach a Bible study, as you study the Bible for yourself, and you study a passage of Scripture, you need to ask yourselves, how does this passage point me to Christ? How does this, how does this passage point me to the Lord Jesus? Because that's what he's saying, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When you read um, Psalms 23, we all know Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Re- I, I love reading that passage and replacing Lord with Jesus or adding Jesus to Lord. The Lord Jesus is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. You know, it's, it's a beautiful passage because the Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the whole point of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is to point you to the main figure in the book, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then ultimately, as we're looking at this morning, to point you to this future celebration, the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to be a glorious, beautiful celebration for all who are in Christ Jesus. I don't know if we're going to be doing the cha-cha, or I don't know if we're going to be doing the other things, but it's going to be an amazing celebration, an amazing wedding that you will get to partake in when Christ returns. Um, Timeline of the marriage supper of the Lamb, we hold to a pre-tribulation view of the rapture. That means that right now we're in the church age. The next prophetic event will be the rapture of the church where Christ returns for his bride, takes her up to heaven for a seven-year tribulation period. And during during the tribulation period on earth, the body of Christ will be in heaven celebrating the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. And at the end of the seven-year tribulation, we're going to look, and we're going to look at this next Sunday, the last half of Revelation chapter 19, at the second coming of Christ, which immediately rolls into at the very next verse. He says, then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. You've seen the artwork of Jesus on the white horse and all the people behind him and talking about the second coming. You've probably seen those pictures of that in the past. Well, next Sunday, if you join us, we're going to dive deep into the second coming of Christ at the end of the great tribulation period. But remember, family, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And remember this, no matter what's happening in this world, for the believer, the best is yet to come. This is actually the worst it's going to get. It's going to be nothing but, it's, it's going to be glorious in the future when we see our Lord and Savior face to face. Amen? Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this study this morning of Revelation chapter 19 of the marriage of the Lamb. Lord, help us to let this bring joy to our hearts. Let this bring excitement. Let this bring a spirit of dancing in our hearts and our minds. Let us celebrate, Lord. Let us enjoy you, God. Let us um, just rejoice in our relationship and our reunion with you. And let it bring us joy and excitement as we look forward to your return one day. And we will get to celebrate with you. We will get to feast at the marriage of the Lamb. Lord, as a, as a bride, help us, God, to prepare our hearts. Help us to prepare our hearts by studying your word. Help us to prepare our hearts by walking in the spirit. And Lord, help us to prepare our hearts by repenting and crucifying the deeds of the flesh. Lord, help us to grow in grace. Help us to grow in truth. Help us to grow in your word. And Lord, most importantly, help us to grow in our love for you. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen.